So I thought I'd do a thing on Christmas, just a very brief thing, a different angle perhaps than sometimes we see, um, just to kind of tie threads together. And I thought it'd be a very good thing. So we'll just, uh, um, I'm going to start with some Christmas quotes to just to get you uh, kicked off. And one of them is most remarkable, how Augustine so beautifully ties the eternal and the temporal, the infinite and the finite together. God so loved us that for our sake, see through whom time was made, was made in time. Interesting thought. Older by eternity than the world itself. He became younger in age than many of his, his servants in the world. God who made man was made man. He was given existence by a mother whom he brought into existence. He was carried in hands which he formed. He was nursed at the breasts which he filled. He cried like a baby in the manger in speechless infancy, this word without which human eloquence is speechless. There's a lot to that thing. It's a deep, rich meditation on the mystery of the incarnation. And it's like a set, set of Matryoshka dolls, you know, the, the dolls within dolls within the dolls, because there are mysteries within paradoxes, within conundrums, within posers almost. The, the scriptures filled with all these images, who God is, and then the di divine trinity, and then the incarnation, and then his ability now as the man to take on our sins, and on it goes. All these things are totally unique. I love this other one as well. This is one of my favorite Christmas quotes in, by Richard Crashow. Welcome all wonders in one sight. Eternity shut in a span. Summer in winter, day in night, heaven and earth, and God in man. Great little one, whose all-embracing birth lifts earth to heaven, stoops heaven to earth. Again, this is not a lovely way of poetically describing this deep mystery, because you really can't grasp it. Uh, poems, poetry helps, but it's a nuanced understanding. Uh, and then this wonderful prayer, prayer by Martin Luther. All praise to thee, eternal Lord, clothed in a garb of flesh and blood, choosing a manger for a throne, while worlds on worlds are thine alone. Again, you see the richness, because we're trying to understand. It's, we, it's, uh, the problem with sometimes with celebrating Christmas is by dint of its, its familiarity, it loses its power. And so you want to see it in new, frame it in new ways, with new eyes, and use your creative imagination uh, for doing that. Another quote that I like so much by G.K. Chesterton, the hands that made the sun and stars were too small to reach the huge heads of the cattle, and God, who had, only, had been only a circumference, was seen in the center. Again, you look at these poetic and, and, and powerful descriptions, and they add to the imagination, but it, it just transcends our grasp, our understanding in, in so many ways. But there's a lot of craziness that's associated with Christmas, too. A lot of um, silliness, and the music of the, of the season has been diminished um, as, as time has gone by, and the hymnody has changed as well. Winter Wonderland, the, the things of this sort, uh, wishing of my, Bing Crosby and a white Christmas. And, uh, it started in the 30s and the 40s especially, and then it became a dominant theme. So the most banal things, uh, just, you just think of some of these idiotic top tunes, um, you know, jingle bells and uh, other, other kinds of things. Just stop and think about how banal they are, how trivial they are and how diminished they are in comparison with the great hymnody of the church. And I think about uh, the, the wonderful uh, masses that are celebrating this, this extraordinary um, incarnation. And so it's been a time, but there's also popular cultures got it all wrong too. It's kind of interesting because you see, here's the typical Christmas card type of thing where they've got they're all together. I love this. You got the magi over here. So you and you got the you got the shepherds over here. You got the them in the in a little kind of a bizarre little house kind of a thing here. And uh, the, the the wise men and there's always three of them. And they're 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 riding camels and um, <clears throat> and they're going to give their gifts. It's all completely wrong. Um, first of all, the, the shepherds never saw the magi. When when the shepherds went there, he was in. 
a, um, a stable, and probably it was a cave, one of the limestone cave caves in the Bethlehem area, there were numerous ones, where they actually took care of the cattle and the, and the livestock in those caves. Very likely that's where he was. He was not in a house. Um, by the time the Magi show up, he was in a house, the, the, the star which they'd seen in the east, went, and it, it actually pointed out the very house they were in, and by that time they were in a house. They never saw each other, nor does it tell us that there, there were three of, of the wise men. There were three uh, Magi, Mag, Magi, but rather it doesn't tell us how many there were. They figured out because of the three gifts and so forth. But we don't know that. We don't know that they rode camels. We don't know what their names were, even though we have Caspar, Melchior, but Belshazzar, you see, and all these things. Where did all this crazy stuff come from? Um, and I call it the gospel according to Hallmark. Yeah. <laughs> these crutch scenes, they're all in there, you know, but, but, let's all gather together. Um, but it reminds me of a thing that um, Big Cardwell, or Big, are you here? I don't know if um, I was hoping he'd be here today because he'll enjoy this. He sent me something that I've, I've seen before, and it's this thing here. I love this. It's far side. So here's your far side. Unbeknownst to most theologians, there was a fourth wise man who was turned away from bringing fruitcake. <laughs> you just see the look on his face there. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's the gift that keeps on giving. So Vic Cardwell and I had a dialogue on this. You see, here's what happened. He uh, sent this little thing. I'm sure you've seen this, but it broke me up. My, this is the same image, you see. Um, my dad traveled, uh, traveled the state for CNS Bank, and all South Georgia banks would give him a Claxton fruitcake for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> we had so many, I can't be in the same room with one anymore. I hope you both are well. My response to that was, I have seen and loved this card. The gift that keeps on being regiven. <laughs> I have re-given it myself. It never stays for long. It has a short half-life in my house. Um, and so then he, 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 his response, the fruit is not edible and it's all held together with lukewarm. <laughs> my, my response to that was Elmer's glue-all may also play a role in their longevity. I wonder if someone has put a tracking device in one of them. <laughs> yes, he, right, he responded, it rusted out. <laughs> But then my response was, but only after it circumnavigated the world three times being re-gifted. <laughs> I can't endure those things, but they, maybe you're different from me. But anyway, I go back to this. And it, it, the banality that, um, that is missed with the truth that we've seen and been looking at this, this statement, which is my one-sentence Christology. It's my one-sentence vision of who Jesus is and the, all the scriptures which anticipate him. Because again, the inspired word points to the incarnate word, doesn't it? And that's why Jesus said, beginning with Moses and the Psalms and all the prophets, he began to speak to them all the things concerning himself which were in the scriptures. In other words, it's about me. It always was. And so all the prophets bore witness to the one who would come. And as I journey through the scriptures, and I've been telling you, giving you a little report from time to time about my progress. Are you ready for my report? I have my, my listening progress. I'll probably never get any of you to do this, but, you know, stiff-necked and rebellious people. But um, what's, what's to lose? Try it for a week. But I'm up to this. To carry his cross. I'm up to Mark 15. I started on uh, Halloween. So I think I'm going to get the end, end of the New Testament before the end of the year. I love that because, you see, there's so much, you know, when I'm driving, when I'm making food for caring, when I'm marshing up or anything, there's a lot of extra time you have. And so it's amazing how quickly you can go through it. But the thing that struck me the second time through in this rapid thing, because then it forces you to see it all at once. And you begin to realize all that preparation and then you had 400 years of silence in between that as well. And there were no prophets, and they recognized that. As First Maccabee says, there are no prophets now. It's a prophetic silence. But then the one who came, the light would come. And uh, he would then, John began to proclaim him. 
and that he would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that, just as the Old Testament concludes with the coming of John, so it also can. And suddenly you hear the beginning of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. You hear that name. And after not knowing that name, we're hearing it. Just intimations, but very vague indeed. In this bloody sacrificial system. And all the exhortations, the prophetic exhortations, against the people because of their failure to obey God, their failure to respond to him. And it wearies me almost, it's almost too much, even though all the prophets have a consolation as well as a condemnation. Nevertheless, it's a hard thing to hear it again and again, and to listen to the law, and to realize there weren't even any sacrifices for intentional sins. What does that do with you? If you're thinking at all, you'll realize the law was never meant to save anybody. It's impossible of attainment. That's why David says, if there was a sacrifice, I'd do it. He says, I can only appeal to your covenant love, to your grace. And that's really what it, because in all ages, the basis for salvation has always been the death of Christ. The means of salvation has always been grace through faith, not works. The object of that faith is, is, is God, and the content has, has changes. This concept, though, of the, uh, of, of the basis of salvation is uh, an important concept because we see, as I say, the death of Christ worked backwards retroactively as well as in the forward. You see, it was the death of, of death that ended death itself, you see, Christ himself. His death worked backwards to the first Adam, because God transcends the boundaries of space and time. That's why I tell you, if you really think about it, any time you pray for someone's salvation, you're asking God to have done something before the foundation of the world. You process that one, think it through. It's, it's powerful. And the one who transcends space and energy and matter and time, the one who spoke them into being, is the one who came into being and, and became one with us. So the means of all salvation has never been works. It's religion is just that. It's, a, it, it's man's efforts to reach or placate or earn or attain favor or merit with God or how they, however they view it. It could be the Atman in, the, in, in, um, in, in uh, Hinduism. It could be um, the uh, attainment of Nirvana, Satori, all kinds of things. But at the same time, every, it's always a work system. And it's always bringing the ultimate down to our level or us to that level, hoping that somehow God's going to grade on a curve or you know where it goes. And then it's, it's insanity. It's all or nothing. Either it's, even if you were like ivory soap, 99 and 44, 100 percent pure, which is pure what? Um, but um, even if you were, that 0.66 percent would be enough to condemn you because God is a God of light and he cannot endure darkness at all. So how can God make it possible for us to know him? The awful grace that he's provided at what cost, you see, that we would hardly begin to dimly realize, and they had no clue that the Mashiach um, ben Yosef, the Messiah, the son of J Joseph, the suffering servant, they have no clue that he would also be the one and the same with the Mashiach ben David, the son of David, the, the reigning king. That's what they had plumped for the coming of the reigning king over the suffering servant, and thus they missed him because they were looking for a, a deliverer. Even now the Jews, uh, Jews suppose that the Jesus, Jesus didn't fulfill the job description for Messiah. They missed the point because it was necessary for him to come, and the scriptures made it clear, Isaiah 53, by the way, systematically not read in the synagogues, uh, because it's too obvious, and, uh, but that we go from there. Here it's amazing, so the, the object of faith, and then the content as God, but he will not hold us responsible for light we haven't heard or seen. So it, this is a very important principle, because this is not our trying to reach God, it's him reaching down to us. And so the inspired word reveals that the infinite word who created matter, energy, space, and time, that the logos, the word of God, the eternal one, is actually the one who also would come and take humanity into himself, but with undiminished deity, the deep mystery that's involved there. And therefore it was needful for him to be fully God and fully man, because if he was not fully God, his sacrifice would not have been efficacious. It's an infinite price. Only God can pay it. 
At the same time as we're not fully man, it would have just been a, a kind of a, um, a, a Gnostic gospel. It just He looked like a man, but he wasn't. But rather, he had to be fully man, and it had to be blood, and human blood, and it had to be one who was in the, uh, truly born as a man, but not with a woman. So here he would partake in humanity, but without the sin nature that was being transmitted from generation to generation. So the concept that he would become the incarnate word, and yet more, he would be also become the indwelling word. The concept that boggles the imagination, we really staggers, it staggers me to think about how the one, if you to look at Jesus, would be to look at, at, at eternity and infinity. And I imagine being on his right when I'm walking on the, on the road with him. That's where I like to be. I'd like to rather I, I imagine myself. Imagine yourself walking with him. And it wouldn't be nice to be on his right and just to see and you're looking in that face that has eternity, who spoke all things into being, the authority that he has. And they didn't even know who they were with. And at the amount of transfiguration, they began to realize this. He was more bright than the sun itself, blinding them with his brilliance and illumination. And, and the the veil of his flesh was briefly, momentarily removed, just for a moment, but then came back. Because no one can look on him and live. So that you see this idea of becoming in, in dwelling words, it's, it's almost too much to imagine, the mystery of the incarnation. I did a, I did a um, my reflections once, I'll call this, and this is the co copy of that, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but just a few bits from it. Um, but it's a back issue of reflection. Although we live in a pluralistic culture that tells us Christianity is just one option in a whole cafeteria of equally valid spiritual choices, a closer look at the Bible reveals its profound uniqueness because it is utterly unique. Um, and this theme of the uniqueness of Scripture, uh, it's claims about who God is, about the Trinity. Only a, tri a triune being can create love because you see, there has to be a love, love has to be more than one person. And if you're just an absolute monad, it wouldn't be the lover and the beloved, the love that flows between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is a community uh, of being. God is a community, a, so a society of being. He wasn't bored, and he had no lack. You see, he didn't create us because he needed a friend. <laughs> he had perfect communion and, and equality, and yet authority was all there. All this mystery of him. And so he was complete and perfect in himself, and yet in the overflow of the richness of the divine love, he creates beings in his own image, who as image bearers would then be spiritual beings because he's a spiritual being. And they would be moral beings because he's a moral being. You see, they would also be um, big aesthetic uh, beings because he is the source of all beauty. And they would be rational beings because he's the source of all truth. And so we reflect that, and we're relational beings because we're bearing his image, and we know that the currency of heaven is relationships, not earthly bound wealth. You're going to leave it all behind. What are you going to send ahead? And surely it won't be the time, talent, and treasure you've been allotted in this world, and your forge will be accountable, but rather it will be the grace of God that has given you these things to call you into that relationship. So I, as I say, who would have imagined that the transcendent creator of the universe could, would have personally visited our planet, in, even in splendor and majesty. But he did not come in splendor and majesty. He came and among his own, and he was, he was um, essentially one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. He was the other ultimate ex exemplar of other-centered love. You know how I define agape. How do I define agape? There's my man, Mr. Mr. Bodhi, the salamander comes through. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I talk about the, the yeah, the, the obelisk, the, the, the obelisk of Sal Salmanizer became the oblong salamander. <laughs> he, he distorts everything, I tell you. <laughs> but uh, but it, he's right here. The es essence of agape love is the steady intention of your will toward another's highest good. I look at my wife's eyes. I've always seen that. Always her intention has been for my highest good. Her still. It's a, it's a love of the will. Therefore, you can love your enemies with that will. Because even if you have an enemy, you can will their best good. If they're not a believer, that they come to know him. Will be their highest. And if they are a believer, they become like Christ.
which would make them actually more lovable. But you see, that's why I'm glad he didn't tell us to like one another. You see, as I've liked you. Uh, there are a lot of people I, I don't like, to be honest about it. Some of you might... No, no. Um, <laughs> but I call to love all people, and that is I can pray for my enemy. And, and, and because, you see, I can will their highest good. It's an amazing thought. And here is one who made it possible for us to have a right relationship with him by underwriting the cost himself, so that actually by coming and paying our price, because God must judge sin. He cannot forgive sin. Somebody must pay the price. We are in a moral universe. And if anybody can get away forever with murder, with rape, with cruelty, forever, it's not a just universe. It's an immoral universe. And this is why it's fascinating that atheists will, come, will demand and, and they'll say, how could a God, good God allow evil to suffer? But their own system actually says that there's not going to be any justice in the end because it's just a, a, a crap shoot. And you're here for a moment. You're gone. You see, a food for the worms. People will get away with murder. But you see, they're appealing, though. This oddest thing, they're appealing when they speak of evil. In order to speak of evil, you must be having good, because otherwise evil is nothing. It's a parasite of the good. And so they have to, they have to have, appeal to God to condemn God. But unless ultimate reality is moral, you can't morally condemn it. So the idea here is that you've got a being who is so transcendent that we, even in our, even as an atheist, he, he lives better than he, his philosophy. Because he lives as if there is meaning and value and, and truth. He lives as if there are things that are truly beautiful and truly good and, and, and uh, truly lovely, that, that there's a beautiful, there's a beauty, goodness, all that's in that. So here is one who makes it possible. This, he came in weakness and vulnerability of a little child, a child who would grow up to be spurned and rejected by his own people, a man of sorrows whose suffering and death would purchase the gift of divine forgiveness and eternal life, because God cannot forgive sin, yet he can forgive sinners. Why? Because his own son underwrote the cost, so he could be just and still forgive sin. Somebody pays the price. And then we say, oh my gosh, you're telling me if we don't come to Christ, then he's the only way? Friend, you have no other option. Your way, and it's not because you didn't know the truth. You died because you were separated from God because of your sin, of it, because, of, because of the nature that we are by nature then alienated from God, enmity for him. No, he's the one who gave you an option. And I know of no other Savior. Can you think of another who did what he claimed, who offered what he did? There's nothing. There's nothing like this at all. So the decisive, <coughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the central mystery of the, of the Christian faith. I'm, I'm just going to be selective in my comments. But, but to, to, he claimed uh, as the God-man that to know him is to know God, to see him is to see God, to hear him is to hear God, to confess him is to confess God, to hate him is to hate the Father, to reject him is to reject God, to receive him is to receive God, to honor him is to honor me is to honor is God, you see, because I am the Father of one. So this deep and profound mystery. And yet he came <coughs> in weakness and in humility, not to serve, but to be served, to seek and to save that which is lost because it's God's other centered love. That makes no sense to me because I cannot imagine what was us in us that was so lovable, lovable and lovely. When you look at your true heart, when you understand what you're really like, you realize you have far more in common with Adolf Hitler than you do with Jesus Christ. Farm, there's no comparison, you see. And the, <coughs> the heart condemns itself because we know we can't even keep up with our own moral standard. Romans 2 makes it very clear. So we have this dilemma here. So he's eternal, he's omniscient, omniscient and omnipotent. He's the creator of all things, and yet he's also a clear case in support of his full humanity subsequent to the incarnation, his human birth, his human development. He grew in wisdom and, 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 and uh, stature, in favor with God and man. It was a developmental process. He was fully, he knew what it was like to have the human elements of a body and a soul and a spirit, as well as human names such as man, son of man, son of David. And he knew all what he knew about, except for sin, all the limitations. He got tired, hungry, thirsty, sorrowful, and he died. And so this kenosis, that he emptied himself, the Philippians 2 text, is, is the key that is here. So just pulling this together, though, 
Peter, subsequent to his art incarnation, he now has a divine human nature. And the astonishing thing is that when we come to put our trust in him, it becomes the indwelling word, so that he is in you and you are in him. The amazing thing then is you become the word became flesh. You become a unique expression and manifestation of Christ in you because he's in you and you're in him. So you have infinity and eternity in you. You have both God is near and both God is far. It's a deep and profound mystery. And he exhorts us to follow in his steps, but the key to imitating Christ is to identify with him. You can't imitate him unless you've been identified with him, and you can't make that happen. God has done that, and Ephesians 1 to 3 shows us how all that's been done. Uh, that have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, as you love and serve others, we're called to do this. So there's a magic to Christmas, because it illustrates the way, way things ought to be. The way it intimates the kingdom is yet to come. And if there's a sorrow to Christmas, because it re raises expectations and hopes that the, that the world never de de delivers. I used to watch the Christmas Carol, as I recall. It was, um, yeah, there's two versions of it. Um, 1938 with Richard, well, Reginald Owen playing Scrooge. And then Alec Knight, there's a 1951 Mel's Sim. I remember I was a kid. I was about six years old when I started watching these movies. For some reason, they'd always be on the night before. I'd stay up real late by myself and watch them. It became my tradition. And it made me hope for a better world, you know, a world in which the Scrooge could actually become that. But you know, it wasn't realistic. A lifetime of that, it, you harden yourself to the point of no return. That said, however, it's a lovely story. And you'd love it to be so. And it, it, it evokes a longing for a world that's just not enough, because even then I knew uh, something about the story, as I say, created a, a longing for a better world. Because I knew that the, the magic for Christmas was the night before, because I knew that the gifts and the experience would be a letdown. And indeed, so it is in the letdown of many people, there's more suicides this, at, this, at this time of year. Many have a lot of loneliness that creates expectations, longings, and hope for a better world. But if you don't have that hope, it becomes painful and, and disastrous. So to inflame a, a living hope and the realization that what you long for isn't on this world. We're waiting for a better world to come. And that's what Christmas, in my mind, evokes that longing. And, and therefore, I, I think about the idea of coming, come Lord Jesus. It's the way things ought to be. It's the kingdom that yet, is yet to be. And that's why I say that the best is yet to come that God is saving the best for last. I'll end with these words. In, that he, in, the, in his um, first advent, Christ came in the weakness of infancy to become the suffering servant of those who are hopelessly lost. In his second advent, he will come as the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. He first came veiled in the form of a child, but next time he comes, and it will be soon, he will come unveiled, and everyone will know him for who he really is. In his first advent, a star marked his arrival. In his second advent, the heavens will roll up like a scroll. The stars will fall into the sky, and he himself will illuminate him. The first time he came, the Magi brought him gifts, but the next time he comes, he will bring gifts and rewards for his own. The first time he came, there was no room for him. The next time he comes, the whole world will not be able to contain his glory. At his first appearance, few attended his arrival, but at the second uh, appearance, every eye will behold him. He came first as a baby, but he will come again as the glorious ruler of the universe.